then I took the test for air traffic controller, and, and I took the test for military police and for medic. And this is kind of important because what happened was when I went to take the test for air traffic controller, that's when I found out I was colorblind, which impacts the fact that I'm an artist now. And um, they says, well, you can't be an air traffic controller because uh, you couldn't tell the red dots from the green drops from the orange drops on the screen. So too many planes, I've crashed too many planes. So that shot air traffic controller. Uh, couldn't be a military police because basically I have amblyopia, I have lazy eye, well, I couldn't see. And so the only thing left was to be a medic. And it was like 11.30 at night. It's amazing how I can remember these times. Um, and so I had to take care of him. And we were really busy that night. I mean, we had all the EKG machines going. We had oxygen tanks going. We had tent oxygen tents. We had everything. And, and I remember when he came in, he, they had to remove both his arms above the elbow and both legs above the knee. And that's all he was. And I remember uh, I had my stethoscope in and I'm listening, I'm taking his heart and I got to rub the stethoscope because if you have put a cold stethoscope on him, it will cause his heart to beat faster. And so he was in tachycardia. He was at 180 beats a minute and his heart stopped. It was like in a cave, it just stopped. And I thought, oh, and I remember hitting the stethoscope on my hand and said, well, something wrong with that stethoscope. And I put it back on his chest and it took me like 30, 40 seconds to realize that his heart had stopped. So we started CPR and, you know, to watch his eyes roll back and then his eyelids close. And the doctor came in and we worked on him for 30 minutes. And you gotta remember, he's got IVs in places that you can't normally start IVs. And, and, he, and the doctor said, that's it, we're gonna declare him dead. And, and I remember getting so angry and I looked at the doctor and I said, we, we need to keep working on him because we would, some people we could save. And then I never forget what he said. He says, Wesley, what kind of life would he had if he had lived? Well, you're in a war zone now. We're, we're busy. And it was like I shook my head and I said, okay. Went and got the black bag, tagged him, rolled him over into the bag, zipped up the bag, took him down to the mortuary where we kept all the remains, came back and went right back to work like nothing happened. This was every night. But the guy with the striker frame, we turned him one time and he stopped breathing. Now we didn't have, what is, uh, we didn't know much about, uh, what do we call it now, uh, induced a coma. We didn't do that. So his body went into a shock. So we turned him back over. We turned him over in about 10, 15 seconds, put the respirator on him, and we left him like that. And he stayed in a coma for 10 days. And after 10 days, he just woke up out of the blue. He said, what day is it? And we were like in shock. I was there when it happened. And we told him, he said, am I going to be okay? And we said, you're going to be just fine. I mean, what else were we going to tell him? And so we started to breed him again and keep him, his, you know, and uh, eventually we transferred him to the Philippines and then he got transferred to um, uh, Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. because we kept up with everybody and we found out later on that he survived and he did okay. So that was a success, that was a miracle. Mm -hmm. But for every miracle, you'd have two or three deaths, mm -hmm. no matter what war you're in, no matter what war is coming, no matter what conflict is coming, we have an obligation as veterans and as civilians who served in the military in civilian capacities. We have an obligation to each other to help the society that we live in understand that peace is better than war and healing is better than not healing.